Good morning, everyone. It's a blessing to be able to gather with you this morning. Pardon me, as I'm sure I'll cough my way through this sermon this morning. I'm just getting over a bit of a head cold, but it's always a blessing to be able to gather together with you and study another portion of God's Word. We are wrapping up our short series this morning on God in three persons. We've spent the last couple of weeks talking about God the Father and God the Son, dealing with a subject that's kind of hard for a lot of folks to get their kind of heads wrapped around and it's not only a good refresher for us it's a good way that we can hopefully take some of these things we've studied these last couple of weeks so that we can explain to others that while they are three separate persons they are still one God and the scriptures bear that out if you would this morning though let's start off in Isaiah chapter 6 please Isaiah chapter 6 is another one of those passages that talks about God, but there's a phrase there in Isaiah chapter 6. I just chose chapter 6. But in Isaiah chapter 6, there's a phrase there that I think is also partially important when talking about God in three persons, and specifically this morning, God the Holy Spirit. In the year King Isaiah died, I, Isaiah, saw the Lord sitting on a throne on high and lifted up. And the train of his robe filled the temple. And it stood seraphim, one each had six wings, with two he covered his face, with two he covered his feet, and with two he flew. And one cried to another and said, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts, and the whole earth is full of his glory. Now we've talked about God the Father, we've talked about God the Son, and now we're talking about the Holy Spirit and talking about their unity. I think it's important to recognize there's a phrase that is repeated all throughout God's Word found there in verse 3. Holy, holy, holy. Now we've talked before about repeating something three times means it is holy, means it is holiest to the highest degree, or means that it is complete to the highest degree. But the reason three is that complete number, have you ever stopped and thought about? It's because it represents God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. Oftentimes when you see things repeated, even in phrases, especially in the Old Testament, you see some in the New Testament, but especially in the Old Testament, you will often see a phrase repeated three times. For God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit being in unity. Being, although three separate persons, being one God. And that's what we understand when we read passages that we have gone over and over so far in our study so far. Back in Genesis chapter 1 there in verse 2, we've read over and over again. The earth was... Excuse me, the earth was without form and void of darkness and over the face of the deep, and the Spirit of God was hovering over the face of the waters. There in those passages, in just the first couple of verses of God's Word, we see representatives of the Father, of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. We see it talked about in verse 26 when God says, Let us make man in our image. He's not talking about just himself. He's talking about that Father, that Son, and the Holy Spirit. He was as much there as the Father was, and he was as much there as the Son was there in the very beginning. Multiple persons can still be one flesh. We see that as soon as creation is finished in Genesis chapter 2. Therefore, man shall leave his father and his mother, hold fast to his wife, and they shall become one flesh. For those of you that are married or have been married, were you and your spouse or are you and your spouse one singular flesh that's inseparable? No, we recognize that. We understand that. He's talking in a hyper, hyperbolic sense. He's talking in a, in a sense of scale here. And so it is with the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. They are one. They are unified. They are one person there while also being three different individuals. They established this in the very beginning. Jesus expounds on this in John chapter 17 there in verse 21. Turn over there with me if you will. John chapter 17, if you'll turn over to chapter 17, read with me there verse 21. John 17 beginning in verse 21 reads, that they may all be one as you, Father, are in me and I in you that they also may be one in us, that the world may believe that you have sent me. 
Here it is. Jesus is in a longer prayer for believers that they all be unified, that they all be of one mind, as you, the Father, the Holy Spirit, and I are all one. Not that they are united in flesh, but they are of the same mind. They are of the same desire. They are of the same will. They are of the same drive. They all desire the same thing. I hope you'll see this morning as we wrap up this short series and as we continue with looking back on what we've already discussed, a lot of these same roles, a lot of these same desires are the same across the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. And in fact, Christ goes one step further. He says, I desire that Christians have the same kind of relationship that I, the Father, and the Holy Spirit have. I pray that they have the same with one another. Not that we all be married to one another in one flesh, but that we all be of one mind. We all desire the same thing, to live godly upon this earth, to desire to get to heaven for all of eternity, to help one another as iron sharpens iron, that we may all achieve that same goal. Just as God's desire is that all men and women on earth be saved, that they seek out salvation, that they draw near to Him, Ultimately, Christ says, even builds upon this one step further there, that you may all be one in us. We are striving while on this earth to be one, to be Christ-like, to be like-minded with God. And we fall short. There are things on this life that distract us. Satan is still tempting us. There are ways in which we fall short here, but we are trying our best and grace covers where we fail as long as we are striving. But what we are ultimately aiming for is to be like God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit in heaven with them for all of eternity. One mind. One desire. One goal. The Holy Spirit, God, God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit all desire that same thing. To have the same relationship with us as they have with one another. That's why Christ came and died on the cross for your sins and for mine. So that we can continue to strive closer and closer day by day as we study God's Word, as we seek to fulfill it, to be of one mind and one person with our God. The Holy Spirit also makes it clear, Acts chapter 5, that the Holy Spirit is just as much an individual as God the Father and God the Son. Acts chapter 5, beginning in verse 3, we won't read the whole account there, but Ananias and Sapphira have schemed together to lie to the apostles and to God and to make themselves look good before the brethren. But Peter said, Ananias, why has Satan filled your heart to lie to the Holy Spirit and keep back part of the price of the land for yourself? While it remained, was it not your own? After it was sold, was it not your own control? Have you then, why then have you conceived this thing in your heart? You have not lied to men, but to God. Not only does that show again, Holy Spirit is God. They are combined and working together there again. You have lied to God and you have lied to the Holy Spirit. They are both one. But it also shows the Holy Spirit is an individual as well. The Holy Spirit is guiding and directing the apostles. The Holy Spirit is the one able to discern that Ananias and Sapphira are lying. He's the one that searched out their hearts and brought it to Peter's attention. That's why Peter says, you've lied to the Holy Spirit. You've known that we have this ability. You're not going to be able to hide this. You're not going to be able to puff yourselves up and make yourselves look good. You're trying to imitate Barnabas without being Barnabas. In doing so, you have lied to the Holy Spirit, and Ananias and Sapphira shortly thereafter lost their lives because of that. But here is the Holy Spirit. He is God. He will not be lied to. He will not be toyed with. He is still God. So let's look at what the Holy Spirit has done throughout the Scripture. And while we most often focus on the New Testament, and most of our passages this morning will be 
in the New Testament because we know the Holy Spirit is being a revealer of truth and revealing God's will. He's been doing this throughout the, both the Old and New Testament. Ezekiel chapter 11, I'm just borrowing one passage that use this, uses this phrase, but this phrase is found all throughout the Old and New Testament. And the Spirit of the Lord fell upon me. Ezekiel is saying, I started to prophesy, I started to speak, I started to say and be God's mouthpiece. How did I do that? The Spirit of the Lord fell upon me. I began to prophesy, I began to speak as moved by the Holy Spirit. The apostles were not the first one that this happened to. The first instance of this is not in Acts chapter 2. It's all throughout God's Word. Ezekiel 11 and verse 5 continues, And he said to me, Say thus, says the Lord. So you think, O house of Israel, for you know the things that come into your mind. And goes on to prophesy further. Matthew chapter 4 and verse 1, The Holy Spirit in revealing truth was also one who guides people, both in the Old and New Testament, even guiding Christ while he was on this earth. The reason he goes into the wilderness in Matthew chapter 4 where he is tempted by Satan. Matthew chapter 4 and verse 1 reads, Then Jesus was led up by the Spirit into the wilderness and was tempted by the devil. The Holy Spirit is one who, in making sure that God's will is accomplished, that it is being done as one who helps guides people to where they need to be. While Christ was on the earth, he helped even guide him in where he needed to go, no different than he guided Philip to the Ethiopian eunuch, or he guided Paul or Peter or Ananias or anybody else that we talked about. Holy Spirit revealed truth through the apostles, especially while he was on the earth. John chapter 16, begin there with me in verse 7. John chapter 16 and verse 7, this is where Jesus is more in depth talking about how the Holy Spirit and the apostles especially are going to interact in the near future when he passes away. Nevertheless, Jesus says, I tell you the truth. It is to your advantage that I go away. For if I do not go away, the Helper, that is the Holy Spirit, will not come to you. But if I depart, I will send him to you. When he has come, he will convict the world of sin and of righteousness and of judgment. Of sin, <coughs> because they do not believe me. Of righteousness, because I go to my Father and you see me no more. Of judgment, because the ruler of this world is judged. I still have many things to say to you, but you cannot bear them now. However, when he, the Spirit of truth, has come, he will guide you into all truth. For he will speak not of his own authority, but whatever he hears, he will speak, and he will tell you things to come. Holy Spirit is going to come to you, Christ is saying. He's going to reveal to you all truth. And again, he's not doing this of his own accord or of his own will. That doesn't mean he's a servant of God like one of the angels. He is still God. Rather, he's saying he is speaking in unison with the Father, with the Son, and the Holy Spirit. He's not going to tell you something that contradicts what Christ said. He's not going to go against the Father and teach and command the apostles to do something or perform some miracle that God is not going to approve of. They are of one accord. They are still one God. They are still working together even though the Holy Spirit is going to be the main one they will be interacting with. Acts chapter 8 is a great example of this. One of the Holy Spirit's job in revealing truth was not only performing miracles through the apostles, but was performing miracles through the saints, through the gifts of the Holy Spirit. Acts chapter 8, let's read there verse 14 through verse 17. Now when the apostles who were at Jerusalem heard that Samaria had received the word of God, they sent Peter and John to them, who, when they had come down, prayed for them that they might receive the Holy Spirit. For as yet he had fallen upon none of them, they had only been baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. Then they laid hands on them, and they received the Holy Spirit. And from that time on until those gifts went away, as dictated in 1 Corinthians 13, in the first century they were able to speak in tongues. They were able to prophesy. They were able to heal. They were able to gain knowledge. They had a number of miraculous gifts that the Holy Spirit gave them that they could use. The main reason was not to show off was not just to have superpowers. It was, again, to reveal truth. 
to reveal God's word until the fully written word was available to them. The Holy Spirit goes even further, though. Not just in revealing the truth. Paul says the Holy Spirit does much in revealing the depth of God's love. 1 Corinthians 2, verse 9 and 10. But as, is, as it is written, Paul says, I has not seen nor ear heard, nor have entered into the heart of man the things which God has prepared for those who loved him. But God has revealed them to us through his Spirit. For the Spirit searches all things, yes, even the deep things of God. He's not just searching the hearts of men and being busy upon this earth, Paul says. He is revealing the depths of God's love, of God's will, of God's desire to a greater extent than any other prophet of old has seen. He's revealing to us how to have a closer relationship with Him. Yes, even than Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, Moses, and David. Here's the true depth of God's love that Paul is saying that you and I have access to because the Holy Spirit has revealed it. But along with those love, the Holy Spirit also gave plenty of warnings. 1 Timothy chapter 4, if you would turn over there with me, please. 1 Timothy 4 and verse 1, Now the Spirit expressly says that in latter times some will depart from the faith giving heed to deceiving spirits and doctrines of demons, speaking lies and hypocrisy, having their own conscience seared as with a hot iron, forbidding to marry and commanding to abstain from foods which God created and received with thanksgiving by those who believe and know the truth. For every creature of God is good, and nothing is to be refused if it is received with thanksgiving. For it is sanctified by the word of God and prayer. Both in prophecy and just Sometimes flat out stating the Holy Spirit would speak through individuals, would speak through the apostles, and warn the church of dangers that were coming. Of false teachers, of doctrines, of persecutions, of rulers that had it out for them, of all manner of dangers, both physical and spiritual, that they had to keep an eye out for. That was part of his job for a short time while he was on this earth. Ultimately, 2 Peter chapter 1, I think, is one of my favorite passages that talks about the Holy Spirit. Knowing, first of all, that no prophecy of Scripture comes from someone's interpretation. For no prophecy was ever produced by the will of man, but men spoke from God as they were carried along by the Holy Spirit. His job throughout the Old and New Testament until we received the complete written word was to work as God. Was to work in tandem with God the Father and God the Son in revealing the will of God. In revealing the written word. In revealing prophecy. In directing people where they needed to go at certain times and places that God's word might be of most effect and it explode in spreading around the world and helping those that were searching for the lost. And the Holy Spirit really is the greatest one that reveals the relationship between God and man, that reveals to us who God is, who Christ is, like in John chapter 1. John chapter 1, beginning in verse 32. And John bore witness, saying, I saw the Spirit descending from heaven like a dove. And he remained upon him, and I did not know him, but him, but he who sent me to baptize with water said to me, Upon whom you see the Spirit descending and remaining on him, this is he who baptizes with the Holy Spirit. And I have seen and testified that this is the Son of God. John chapter 1, Matthew chapter 4, both great examples. Here is the Son being baptized, not for remission of sins, but as humility in service to the Father. Here is God the Father speaking, This is my beloved Son, hear ye Him. 
And here is the Holy Spirit also descending upon Him like a dove and telling men like John, this is how you know that this is the Messiah. When you see and hear these things. Here is all three, again, working together in unison. And the Holy Spirit has a very important job and role in revealing who God is and who Christ is to man. He speaks through men like Paul in Acts chapter 17. In Acts 17 and verse 24, the God who made the world and everything in it, being the Lord of heaven and earth, does not live in temples made by man. Or again in verse 29, being then God's offspring, we ought not to think that divine being is like gold or silver or stone, an image formed by the art and the imagination of man. He reveals through men like Paul, even when surrounding surrounded by idols and temples to every god under the sun that those in Athens could think of he said no God the Father God the Son God the Holy Spirit these three are different they are one they are unlike anything that man could even come up with it is through Christ that he revealed Matthew 28 we've read this over and over in these studies go therefore and make disciples of all nations baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. So we ask then, what is the Holy Spirit doing today? Well, we read Second Peter just a moment ago, and he's still doing that. Not in as direct a way as he did during the days of the apostles, but he's still speaking through God's Word. This is still not of any private interpretation of a man, This is not some group of men that came together and wrote a book and said, this is what you need to follow, and it's full of contradictions and flaws like any other men when writing. He still speaks to us today. He still reveals the Word of God and His will to us today. He is still guiding people like He did Philip. Maybe not speaking directly to us like He did to Philip, go here and go there and go and preach here and go and preach there. But his providence is still working. Just as God the Father, just as God the Son, so is the Holy Spirit. He's still working in unseen ways and blessing us and helping us. Romans 8 and verse 11, Paul points this out. If the Spirit of Him who raised Jesus Christ from the dead dwells in you, He who raised Christ Jesus from the dead will also give you life to your mortal bodies through His Spirit who dwells in you. If the Holy Spirit was able to guide Christ, if He was able to help Christ, if He was able to raise Him from the dead, do you not think God will help you? Do you not think the Holy Spirit will guide and direct you in ways unseen, is Paul's argument there. We can't speak to Him in the same way. We can't see Him the same way like a dove descending upon Christ or flames of tongues sitting upon the apostles' heads. But He's still working with us and He's still helping us. Most importantly, I think He reveals that God created us to be different. While He spoke the universe into existence, from the stars and the heavens to the bugs and insects to every animal, land, sea, tree, everything. It was us that was made in His image. We were created in the image of God. We were given a special place in creation. He reveals that we were given a special role in creation. Everything else in existence lives to be born, eat, procreate, and die. That is the existence of everything in this planet, in this universe, except for man. The Holy Spirit says, no, you have something else to do. Sure, that's part of what we do. We still work. We still sleep. We still need rest. We still multiply on the earth. 
But our ultimate goal, Solomon, in speaking as the Holy Spirit directs him, had this to say in Ecclesiastes 12. Let us hear the conclusion of the whole matter. Fear God and keep His commandments, for this is man's all. For God will bring every work into judgment, including every secret thing, whether good or evil. We live and move and have our being in Him. It is through following after God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit that we can look into something more than this life. It's more than just getting up, going to work another day, coming home, spending a few hours with some loved ones and friends, going to bed and repeating that process over and over until our bag of bones gives out. There is something more than this temporary life that is filled, yes, with some good things, but with many evil and painful things. There is an eternity to look forward to of blessings if we fear God, keep His commandments, and serve Him with what time we have on this earth. He reveals that we can be united with God for all of eternity. That's why Paul was able to say in Romans 1 and verse 16, For I am not ashamed of the gospel, for it is the power of God for salvation to everyone who believes, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. He reveals that there is an end result to worshiping and serving God and fearing Him unlike following after Baal or Zeus or Buddha or anything else. When I serve Him, I have nothing to be ashamed of. It is power to save you and me unlike anything else that exists. Holy Spirit reveals if you want this salvation... Christ said this in John 3 and verse 5, Truly, truly, I say to you, unless one is born of water and the Spirit, he cannot enter the kingdom of God. Unless you are baptized, unless you serve him faithfully, unless the Holy Spirit takes part in this work, you're lost forever. God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit all take a part in us being able to obtain that salvation. <clears throat> the Holy Spirit ultimately gives us a pattern for us to follow in our life on this earth. Verse Timothy 3, beginning in verse 14, if you'll read with me, please. <clears throat> These things I write to you, Paul says, though I hope to come to you shortly in speaking with Timothy, but if I am delayed, I write so that you may know how you ought to conduct yourself in the house of God, which is the church of the living God, the pillar and the ground of truth. Paul, in writing to Timothy and in part writing to us, the reasons we have letters like Timothy, Corinthians, Ephesians, Colossians, Revelation, left for us to read some 2,000 years later is because the Holy Spirit revealed a pattern of how you and I are supposed to live of how we can be faithful, of how we can serve God and then be in heaven with Him for all of eternity. Turn with me to Revelation chapter 21 and the lesson is yours this morning. <clears throat> Revelation opens with a similar statement that we read in Ezekiel a few moments ago. When the Spirit of God came upon John. Revealed to him primarily things that will soon be coming to pass. But at the very end of Revelation also gives a revealing a little bit more of what the destiny of man is going to look like. Those that are faithful and those that are unfaithful. Revelation 21 and verse 8 talks about this. John records as speaking what the Holy Spirit has shown him in. Now I saw a new heaven and a new earth. For the first heaven and earth, and the first earth passed away. Also, there was no more sea. Then I saw John, then I, sorry, John, saw the holy city. New Jerusalem was coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bridegroom, as a bride adorned for her husband. 
And I heard a loud voice from heaven saying, Behold, the tabernacle of God is with men. He will dwell with them. They shall be His people. God Himself will be with them and be their God. God will wipe away every tear from their eyes. There shall be no more death, nor sorrow, nor crying. There shall be no more pain, for the former things have passed away. Then He who sat on the throne said, Behold, I will make all things new. And He said to me, Write, for these words are faithful. And He said to me, It is done. I am the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end. I will give of the fountain of the water of life freely to him who thirsts. He who overcomes shall inherit all things. I will be his God and he shall be my son. But the cowardly, unbelieving, abominable, murderers, sexually immoral, sorcerers, idolaters, and all liars shall have their part in the lake which burns with fire and brimstone which is the second death. The Holy Spirit spends a great deal in Revelation talking about the blessings that we can find in heaven, the joys, the comfort that we can find in being with God the Father, with God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit for all of eternity. But He also spends time revealing that you are unfaithful. If you don't believe in God, if you don't follow Him, with all that you have and serve Him as He commands, your part will be with those that burn in a lake of fire and brimstone for all of eternity. It will be torment and it will be pain. So who are you going to serve? I hope these things have been helpful to you in this study. It's been a good refresher for me to look at some of these things, to remind myself of some of these things, and hopefully to better be able to explain some of these things to folks that is sometimes a bit of a confusing topic. But I also hope if you are here this morning and you are not a Christian, some of the things that the Holy Spirit revealed cause your heart to be pricked as those in Acts chapter 2. That if you need to obey the Gospel, that now is the perfect time. Now may be the last opportunity that you have. If you need to do so this morning, please, we encourage you, come forward and be baptized. The water is ready. We want to help you. Let us rejoice that another soul is saved and begins their life in service to God. If you're here this morning and you are a Christian that has fallen short in your duty, you have let sin into your life, you have separated yourself from God in chasing after the pleasures that Satan has offered, please again make correction, either privately or publicly by coming forward. Let us help you and let us encourage you. If there's anything that we can do for you this morning, please come forward now as together we stand and sing the song that has been selected.